Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, uh, just before we dismiss the kids, I just want to take a moment just to honor Reinhard Bonke. And I know many of us were awakened yesterday morning with the news that Reinhard Bonke uh, went to be with the Lord. He was 79 years old. Um, and I, as I wrote on Facebook, I can remember in 1989, a long time ago, right, when I went to a conference in Phoenix, Arizona, and Reinhardt was supposed to speak a couple of services, and it was so apparent that the hand of the Lord was on him that the conference organizers had the wisdom just to turn everything over to Reinhardt. And I was totally and forever changed in those meetings as I became very aware of what one person yielded to the Holy Spirit could do. And I watched in those meetings as um, uh, multiple people were healed just being in the presence of God without anyone laying hands on them. I saw people who were oppressed by demons crying out as the presence of God was so strong and uh, they would just gather them up and take them out and br release freedom to them because God was manifesting himself. And I know about four or five years ago, several of us were able to go to Voice of the Apostles in Nashville, Tennessee, and hear Reinhardt speak. And my, it's so funny because my kids loved him. And here's this 75-year-old man, German guy, graduate of the Bible College of Wales, speaking in this heavy German accent and captivating a generation because of what he carried. And there was just no one like Reinhardt when he would stand up and declare, Africa shall be saved, right? And he preached to millions and millions of people, and one of the last decora declarations of his life was that America shall be saved. And he began to do crusades. He actually did one in Oklahoma City a few years ago because of the call that he was sensing that there's a great awakening coming to our nation. And so may we take up the mantle of Reinhard Bonnke and live in his presence and declare his gospel that a great awakening that is already present will continue to come to this nation. Amen and hallelujah. And with that, we will dismiss the kids. Praise God. I'm already preaching, all right? Praise God. And uh, I remember Reinhardt even speaking about an impartation that he got from one of the Jeffrey brothers in England in, gosh, the 1950s, 1960s. And if you know anything about church history, uh, if you'll stu study the Jeffrey brothers, amazing, amazing things that God did through them in England. So praise God. What's that? That freed up some chairs, right? So, yeah, that's okay. It's good. Well, this morning, um, I, I put a teaser on Facebook, and um, people were like, what are you going to preach about, right? Uh, and actually, this is something that I don't think I've ever preached about on a Sunday morning. And I've talked about it at times in Supernatural School, or I've made, revel made references to it. It's something that we just kind of live in, and so I'm shocked that I've never devoted a whole sermon to this, but I'm going to talk today about receiving revelation from God in your dreams, and uh, you know, if you hang around here very long, you know that there's a lot of dreamers in this place, and um, this, this is so biblical, and I just want to say that at the beginning, because sometimes when you start talking about stuff, and I'm going to give you guys some scripture and because we've been so inundated and we've been so um, fed by New Age movements that we don't understand what's really biblical. And so I want to read in, as we begin, and, and the thing is this actually really relates, and I'll talk about this in a moment, but if you study the Hebrew calendar, and there are times that we look at that, there are times that we're more aware than others, but this is the month of Kislev, in the Hebrew calendar, and one of the things that marks the month of Kislev is God encountering you in your dreams. And so, um, you guys are aware that the Christmas story is full of dreams, and that even in the first two chapters of Matthew, God speaks direction to people four times in two chapters. And it's instrumental in the story of Jesus and his birth and his deliverance. And so we'll touch on that in a minute. But I just want to jump in, and I want to begin by reading, of all scriptures, Job 33. When you start reading out of Job, people get nervous. Like, I don't want to hear that sermon. But if you turn to Job 33, verses 14 through 18, this is a very interesting scripture. Indeed, God speaks once or twice, 
yet no one notices it. Isn't that sad? Do you know God's speaking to us all the time, and yet sometimes we don't notice it? God speaks once or twice, and yet no one notices it. In a dream, a vision of the night, when sound sleep falls on men while they slumber in their beds, then he opens the ears of men. Some men need our ears opened, amen, right? And seals their instruction that he may turn man aside from his conduct and keep man from pride. He keeps back his soul from the pit and his life from passing over into Sheol. Wow, that's pretty heavy stuff, isn't it? You could preach and preach out of that, but, you know, God gives instruction and he speaks through dreams, amen? He, he causes turn, to turn aside from pride and sin, and he keeps back our soul from the pit, which the pit and shoal were actually the Old Testament concept of the afterlife, and at times it's associated with hell. So sometimes God can even deliver you from the pit and from hell through your dreams. Hallelujah. So a couple of more scriptures. Um, I won't look at this one, but you might write down Acts chapter, I'm sorry, we'll get to Acts in a minute. But Daniel chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. And a, a very interesting story because King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. And you'll find as you study the word that God speaks clearly through dreams to both godly and ungodly. So if you have a lot of prophetic dreams, don't get on your high horse because he spoke to just as many pagans in the word <laughs> through dreams as he did believers. Okay, now it took people with the Spirit of God in them to be able to interpret what he was saying. So King Nebuchadnezzar has this dream, and he calls all the wise men, all the magicians, all the sorcerers, along with Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he says, okay, here's what you're going to do. He said, you're not only going to have to get revelation of what my dream was, and I'm not going to tell you, you're going to have to know by the, somehow by your wisdom and your magic what my dream was, and then you have to interpret it to me. And if you don't, I'm going to kill you all. That puts a demand on your prophetic gift, right? So actually, Daniel, and then of course you had all this collection of New Age and mysticism, and then you had these four Hebrews who, who knew God and, and Daniel, and they begin to fast and pray because they're like, if we don't get revelation, we're toast, right? And God met Daniel in the night, and he not only revealed what Nebuchadnezzar's dream was, he gave him the interpretation. You can read all that. It's an amazing story. Uh, but it talks about receiving revelation in your dreams, okay? And then, of course, you're like, well, Andy, that's all, that's all Old Testament, and they didn't have the Bible and all that. Yeah, but they had the Spirit of God. And we, even more, have been immersed in the Spirit of God. And Acts chapter 2, let's read this in verses 17 and 18. One of the things that marks the church in the age in which we're living is we're living in a prophetic realm where God speaks to us. His presence is in us. It's up on us, he's around us, he ministers through us, and we hear his voice and we know what he's saying. We know what God is communicating. And so Acts 2 verses 17 and 18 says, And it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth of my spirit upon all mankind, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my bond slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Okay? So we're in that, we're still living in the outpouring of the spirit. So we're to prophesy. The word says, and you shall, pro if you're a son today, you should prophesy. If you're a daughter today, you're called to prophesy. That hasn't passed away. It's still a reality, and it's a mark of the age in which we're living. And God wants to release a spirit of revelation in all of our lives that we hear from heaven. We commune with the Father, 
and he gives us revelation. So I'm going to pray, and we're, I'm going to keep preaching, okay? So, Father, thank you today for a spirit of revelation that's upon us. Father, this is a house, this, and prophets have said, this is a house with a Joseph anointing. And so, Father, we declare that today, that just as Joseph moved in a revelatory realm, and Father, just as Joseph was exalted to, to stand next to kings and next to governors and to decree wisdom and revelation over nations, Father, I thank you that you're taking us higher today in this time frame of Kislev, that there is a release of revelation that is coming upon us as a people. There's a, 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 a spirit of revelation that's coming upon the body of Christ in this moment and in this city that we will decree a thing. And Lord, you said that we would decree a thing and it would affect the state of Oklahoma. And so, Father, today I thank you as we stand in the gates of this state, we're declaring revelation all throughout the state. Father, we're declaring, Father, that there is a, a new season of revelation and insight and mysteries not only being spoken, but being revealed to the people of God. Thank you, Lord, today in Jesus' name. Amen? Hallelujah. So, praise God. Well, let's continue. Let's look at this. That was a good introduction. Amen? So, um, the, I'm going to talk just for a moment about Kislev, and this is some stuff that I got from Robert Heidler from Glory of Zion in Corinth, Texas, and I just don't think anybody can teach on the Jewish calendar like Chuck Pierce and Robert Heidler. Um, but in this month, in the Jewish calendar, we're in Kislev, which is considered by the Jews to be a month of dreams and night visions. Okay? And how do you know, you do realize that one-third of our, our life is spent sleeping. For, for some, some it's more like half. <laughs> and, and in those moments, God, God does not stop communicating, right? And, uh, you know, it's very interesting because apparently in, there are certain, in certain times of the month, uh, the Jews in certain seasons, there are portions of Scripture that they read in that month. And during the month of Kislev, they always find that they, they read about the dreams that are mentioned in the Torah, Okay, and that includes Jacob's ladder, right? Genesis 28, very famous dream. Joseph's dreams about his family, right? The sun and the moon and the stars all bowing down to him. And then Pharaoh's dreams of famine, okay? And uh, Pharaoh's servants' dreams that Joseph interprets while he's in prison, okay? And you can read all of those accounts in Genesis, but... You know, often when it comes to dreaming, uh, we all dream a lot, okay? And, um, but our dreams are often either mis misunderstood, they're dismissed, or they're ignored, okay? And I've just learned over the years, as God has spoken to me through dreams, I pay attention to my dreams. I mean, almost every morning... We get up, and Jamie and I talk about a dream we had last night. Now, it, we talked about one this morning, and we're, we're pondering. And even this week as I was preparing to teach these things, I had some crazy dreams that I'm still trying to figure out. Okay? And, uh, you know, it's really interesting as well. In the Bible, there are over 50 references, 5-0, right? to God speaking through dreams. So this isn't some weird, off-to-the-side, new-agey thing. Now, it can be, right, if you don't know the source or the spirit, but if you read the Bible, and this is the problem. Sometimes people are like, well, I don't know about that dream stuff. Read the Bible. Sometimes we don't read Scripture, and we criticize, and we have no idea what the Bible says. Right, So, God spoke to people through dreams over and over and over again in the Word. So, let's talk about that, okay? Now, here's where we run into trouble, because many times dreams reflect our natural events in our lives and not revelation, okay? Uh, you know, because you can have, sometimes because our minds process our day through dreaming, 
I'm dreaming all the time about building houses right now. <laughs> right? If I find that there are times in my life when I'm in a lot of stress, um, I, I'm dreaming that I'm a teller in a bank and I can't balance my drawer. That's because I used to do that. I worked in college and some of those things, and you know, I so uh, you know, I associate stress with not getting in balance. Anybody ever worked in that position? You understand balancing a cash drawer, right? It's, it can be stressful. So, you know, in those moments, we have dreams that our, our mind is attempting to piece together the thoughts and the events of the day. It's very, very common, okay? Even, we won't turn there for um, the sake of time, but I want you to write down Isaiah 29, verse 8. And if you read that verse, it basically says, a hungry man goes to sleep, and he dreams he eats something, or a thirsty man goes to bed, and he dreams, thinks he drinks something, but he wakes up hungry and thirsty, right? Your mind is processing those things, okay? And uh, that's very natural. That happens to all of us, but it's not revelation when we dream those things. Um, you know, we all have universal dreams, you know, Running. Anybody ever dream where you're running from something? Or dream that you're falling, right? I've always heard that if you hit the ground in your dream, you'll die. I don't think that's true, right? Anybody, have you done that? Yeah, okay. Um, or that you're flying, right? Isn't that a great dream? And, you know, psychologists say that if you dream that you're flying, you've overcome something in your life. Um, you never fly? Oh, my gosh. Flying dreams are the best, right? And I usually have like a Superman costume on, right? I've actually flown with Sean Bolts in a dream one time. That was interesting. And we flew to, to um, Dutch Sheets' house. It was a very interesting dream. Um, have you ever been naked in a dream? Yeah. Right? <laughs> Dean has. He's like, yeah, I have, right? <laughs> <laughs> We're not even going to try to interpret that. I don't even want to go there, okay? <laughs> you staying out of sight? Okay, whoo, all right. <laughs> Hiding, right? Or, or that you've had a test. You ever had a dream that you've been in a test? Now, I've had dreams about testing that were very important. Like I had a dream one time where, you know, it was important that I pass the test, and I believe that it was a spiritual dream. So sometimes God can even speak in those things. I had a dream once, I think, where I was taking a test, and when I finished, Chris Vallotton came and met me and said, now I want you to come with me, and I want you to go to the stage. Right? You can look in all that if you want. So, uh, so you know, even in some of these dreams, even though they can be universal dreams, um, sometimes you're processing things, but pay attention to the details that are happening in your dream, okay? Um, now you can also have, and this is, this is crazy, but you can have demonic dreams. You do, we just established that some of these dreams, they're natural, they're not from God. Sometimes even demonic things can invade your dreams, and you have to be careful because when that starts happening, don't try to attribute what the devil's trying to do in your life to the work of God. Okay, because things can happen. Demons will torment people through their dreams, right? Years and years ago, before I um, was filled with the Holy Spirit and before I uh, got some deliverance ministry, um, I was dreaming about being demon-possessed. I was dreaming about cutting myself, okay? And that's before we even knew what cutting was. And I, w I was like, you know, I think maybe I need some ministry, and, uh, and I did. I went and I got some deliverance ministry. So if you're having tormenting dreams, there's probably something affecting you, coming against you, and go get some deliverance, right? Don't be scared of that because it can really set you free. Um, you know, Satan can even come or the demonic can come and they can speak to you through dreams, they can lie to you, or they can tempt you in dreams, okay? So again, you have to look for some of those open doors, be careful as well, because if you have a dream where you feel condemned or you have a dream that's bringing an accusation against someone else, you need to very carefully discern that dream, okay? Now, God can speak through some of those things, but if, if someone is being condemned or accused in a dream, 
discern very carefully, okay? And again, we could get in deep into dream interpretation and all that, and that's not my purpose at this point. I'm just trying to say, discern the source of the dream. Because how many of you know the word says that we are to discern and um, test every prophetic word that we received, right? So just because someone, even when we get a prophetic word or a prophetic dream, make sure of the source, okay? Um, and this is why sometimes dreaming gets a bad rap, because we get flaky. It's the same reason why the prophetic gets a bad rap, because people haven't been trained in the prophetic, and they get flaky with it, and they cause a lot of trouble, okay? So just like with anything, you have to discern what the source of your dream is, because you can uh, have a, a dream that's, you know, you had pizza at midnight, and, you know, you, you have wacky dreams, you know, or you just watched, um, what, what's that? Bird Box, I guess, yeah, um, that's a movie, right, or, or <laughs> Or, or something that's really demonic, and it can open some kind of door. I mean, when I was a kid, I loved, okay, y'all going to get convicted now, right? I loved Stephen King books. I read all of them. Um, I loved, my favorite magazine was Fangoria, um, which was super bloody about bloody movies. And I love stuff like that. Well, that's a, do you see why I was tormented? right? You know, we, we open the door to all kinds of demonic things, and then we're surprised when we start getting harassed, right? That's a huge open door, and I could talk about, I'll talk that about that a lot, more, a lot more next month in Supernatural School when we talk about deliverance, okay? So, um, you know, so we have to discern what the source is. Now, you also can have an angelic dream, okay? And that is a dream where you are actually receiving a visitation by an angel. And by angels, I'm talking about an angel from the throne of God, okay? Not, not something demonic or a fallen angel, okay? But, you know, and you're like, well, Andy, I don't know about that. Well, you know, many times in the Bible, angels visited people by appearing in their dreams. Uh, an angel appeared in a dream to Joseph to tell him Mary had conceived by the Holy Spirit, right? Now, that probably would have been um, hard for Joseph to receive any other way except from an angel, right? When Mary's like, hey, <laughs> I'm pregnant. I know we haven't been together, right? But this is the Lord, Yeah, whatever, right? But because an angel came to him and, and spoke to him in that dream, he had this angelic encounter. Uh, I think many times, I, I, you know, and I know for me personally, a lot of times when certain ministers show up in my dreams, um, I believe they are angels and I'm getting an impartation. Um, I had a dream, it's been probably two years ago, where, uh, and I'll, t I'll get, talk about it a little bit in a minute, but at the end of the dream, uh, a van pulled up in the parking lot here, and Sam and Kathy Matthews from Family of Faith in Shawnee, Oklahoma, and Heidi Baker were in the van. And they said, please get in the van and come with us. And there was an, a, a, a black man driving the van. And um, I was like, well, I'm kind of busy now. I can't go. And the man driving reached out and got me in the crook of his arm, and he was trying to drive away, saying, please come with us. And I was like, I'm sorry, I can't go right now. And so I didn't go. And shortly after that, um, I had had an invitation to go to South Africa. Um, I couldn't go. I felt uh, uneasy. And shortly after, my dad got sick and passed away. And I was telling Charlie Champ about the dream, and he said, I think the... The, the dark-skinned man in your dream is a certain angel that I often see in dreams. And he's, he looks African, and there's a certain anointing. He's, he's, he calls him a Nubian angel. And he said, I think, he, he said, I think that a Nubian angel 
came to give you uh, a similar anointing than was on Dr. Matthews and Heidi Baker. And so I'm like, whoa, I received that, but that scares me at the same time, right? Uh, so pay attention because sometimes I believe angels will come in your dreams to give you an impartation. I think that's one of the reasons they come. All right, so let's continue going along. We can have uh, angelic visitations in our dreams. And I, I just think that um, even as I'm releasing this today and because of the time frame that we're in, I think some of you guys, uh, some of you are already dreaming. Some of you are regular dreamers that experience this a lot. But I think this revelatory anointing is just going to further stir up in your life. Amen? So uh, then we can also have uh, what we would call a revelatory dream. And this is a dream where God speaks to you. Okay? It's a night vision. Okay? A lot of times you'll read through Scripture and they won't say stuff like, Daniel talked about receiving revelation in a night vision. Okay, and, and so um, the word doesn't always, it's murky, you know, because sometimes it can be a dream. Sometimes I've had such radical dreams that I, even uh, there are times that I've gotten up and uh, one of the most powerful dreams I had, I was dreaming, I got up, I went to the bathroom because I'm over 50, and I went back and got in bed and my dream immediately picked up where it had left off and continued, and it was more than a regular dream. It was an encounter that I was having in the night, okay? And so there's revelation that can come to these, and it, they're night visions. They're like a prophetic word or vision, but you're having it in the night, okay? Now, it can be very clear, or it can be filled with symbols, okay? You read through some of these visions, some of these visions and dreams in Scripture, and they're so filled with symbolic things. And then sometimes you can have them so straightforward, there's no doubt about the interpretation, okay? Um, and just like any other form of prophetic revelation, a spiritual dream must be tested and interpreted, okay? I can't emphasize that enough. And, but revelatory dreams are one of the most common forms of revelation, okay? And I think sometimes we have, sometimes it's a common form of revelation because a lot of times when we go to sleep, our defenses are down because sometimes we don't take time in the day to listen to God. And so when we get in bed and our defenses go down, the Lord's finally like, dude, I've been trying to talk to you, so here you go, right? And, and, you know, don't you love that God, it says, the word says that the Lord gives to his beloved, even in his sleep, right? That God's always giving to us. He's always communicating to us. He's always wanting to give us revelation and guidance and, and bring us into something. Amen? So let's talk for a few minutes about um, characteristics of revelatory dreams, Okay? dreams that the Lord gives. So, in the first two chapters of the New Testament, critical revelations are given through dreams a minimum of four times, okay? I heard someone say there are five. I can only find four. You can study that out, right? That's your homework this week, and you can count them. And it's the Christmas story, so it's a good season to read it. See, this is a Christmas, this is a Christmas sermon. Hallelujah. <laughs> Look at me. I got there. So, first of all, we already talked about this, but in, in Matthew, it, the angel tells Joseph that the baby is conceived by the Holy Spirit, okay? Then, in, Ma also, then in Matthew 2, an angel warns Joseph to take Jesus to Egypt for protection. Why? Because Her Herod's going to kill all the boys to and under. So, an angel comes and warns him, says, you've got to take Jesus down to Egypt, Okay? Um, an angel also warns the wise men in a dream not to go back to Herod, right? Because they show up and they say, hey, we're to find this new king. You know, we've been following his star. And Herod's like, mm, very interesting. He's like, when you find him, come and tell me. Why? Because Herod wants to kill him because he doesn't want 
anybody taking his place as king. So for the third time in the first two chapters of Matthew, this angel speaks, this time not to Joseph, but to the wise men. And then the fourth time is an angel tells Joseph, it's time to take Jesus back to Israel. Okay, So you've got this revelatory realm where angelic beings are sent from the Father to interact with people to protect Jesus to, so that God's plans and purposes can be carried out. Don't you love the accounts that we've been hearing for the last 10, 20 years of uh, especially Muslims in the Middle East where it's very hard to get in and evangelize? where they've been having encounters with Jesus in a revelatory dream state. And Jesus is showing up to them saying, hey, I'm the son of God and you need to get saved. Right? You know, and usually God prefers to use men and women to preach the gospel. Okay? But God will do what he needs to do to, to get the message to people, to get them to men and women in closed places because he doesn't want people going to hell. Now, I remember a, a missionary that we know who'd been a missionary in South America for years and years, and they went into a tribe that had never heard the gospel. And the man, the chief, said, my, grand, my father had a dream that someday someone would come and tell us about this Savior and prevent our people from going to hell. He said, where were you? That was a generation ago. Right? And in God's goodness, he's still trying to reach out to people, unfortunately, because many times we won't preach the gospel. Well, the Lord will save those people that need to be saved. He's trying, but how will they hear without a preacher? How beautiful, it's so exciting, isn't it? How beautiful are the feet of them that bring good news, right? May God raise up a generation. You know, everybody argues about who's got Reinhardt Bonnke's mantle now, who's got Billy Graham's mantle now. We've all got it. We've all got the mantle and we've all got the commission and praise God that God raised up a Reinhard Bonke who went and preached to billions of people in Africa. Yeah. Right? Because he was willing. Amen? So, hallelujah, I'm really preaching now a little bit instead of teaching. But I, I just love how God will, will do unusual things because he loves humanity. Right? And he wants them to know his son. Hallelujah. Um, <laughs> another thing about a revelatory dream is that God gives dreams, as I mentioned earlier, even to unbelievers. Right? Genesis 41.7, Pharaoh dreams of a famine and needs an interpretation. He has two dreams, right, about the famine. And uh, it's interesting because Genesis, if you read Genesis 41, 23, again, you can read it later. But um, basically, Joseph, in his interpretation, he tells Pharaoh, he said that this dream happens twice because it means adjustments are needed. Because you've dreamed this twice, God's about to do it, and he's about to do it quickly. So if you get a revelatory dream where you're dreaming basically the same thing, two, three, four times, um, what you're dreaming is coming. And God's already determined it's going to happen, so you need to make adjustments for whatever's coming. All right? That gives me great appreciation, right? Many of you know that several years ago, and it's probably been about seven years ago, I had a series of dreams um, about what God was going to do here and in this city, and that I had a series of dreams as well in the nation of Japan before we moved back. And I'll touch on those in a minute, but let me finish this thought. I'm trying to get it, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, also, God spoke in Judges 7.13, okay? This is the story of Gideon, and Gideon goes down because he's, he's going to spy on the Midianites, 
And this pagan Midianite soldier basically says, I saw this loaf of bread basically roll into camp and flatten everything, right? And, and Gideon's like, oh, oh, that's us, right? And God gave him confirmation to carry out and do what he had been, God been telling him to do. Isn't God good? He can speak through a donkey. He can speak through a pagan soldier to confirm his plans. And isn't that crazy that he speaks to somebody that confirming that they're about to be wiped out? It's such a strange concept. But um, also, you know, I, I mentioned this earlier, but Nebuchadnezzar, right? He had a, this pagan king who has a dream of a statue, and he couldn't interpret it. So it took Daniel to get a, you know, in whom was a spirit of revelation and excellence to interpret the dream. So I want you guys to be aware there are people around you every day that are having dreams. And God maybe has placed you in an office or a company or a family where you have a spirit of Joseph. You have an anointing like Daniel. You have an anointing like Paul to interpret and speak what God is saying to people. And years ago, I found myself in that position where in the company that I worked for when I moved back from Japan, that people were coming to me for dream interpretations. It was weird. I didn't have it on my business card, right? I didn't have it on the plaque on my door. I was a, I was a marketing journalist, right? But people would come and they'd be like, well, I had this dream about this helicopter and this and this. And I was like, well... You know, God's wanting to deliver you from some grief that you're experiencing because of your son's death, right? And it was, a, it was a strange time, but God's wanting you guys to speak revelation and wisdom that points to the reality of Jesus, who's wanting to manifest himself in people's lives, amen? So, um, again, God gives dreams to unbelievers. Now, a lack of prophetic dreams can actually be a sign of judgment. Okay? Samuel, the, um, not Samuel, but Saul, right? Um, the prophet Samuel is dead. Saul has messed up. He doesn't know how to inquire of the Lord. And he's asking, the, he's asking God for dreams. But God would, didn't answer him. And so he was so desperate for revelation because how many know there can come a time where you, you turn away from revelation and the voice of God so much that it's difficult to hear his voice, right? And so Saul, at that point, because he couldn't get any revelation from God, that he actually consulted the witch of Endor, which was, God said, don't do that, okay? But the lack of dreams was actually a sign of judgment. So if we're children of God and we're walking with him, we should be just like Jacob in Genesis 28, right? And I'm not going to read that today. I'm just throwing all kinds of stuff at you guys because this is such a big subject. But Jacob has this dream where angels are ascending and descending. And the Lord says, this is none other than the house of God. What's a house of God? The very first mention of the house of God, it's an open heaven with angels ascending and, uh, ascending and descending, bringing revelation to his children, and he's getting that revelation in a dream. Right? That's a powerful reality of what the church is to be, a people living under an open heaven in a heavenly realm interacting with God through the Spirit, through the Word, through angelic beings, and even through dreams. Amen? Hallelujah. Another thing, and again in my notes, if you are God's child, He will speak to you in a dream. Expect it. Okay? So why does God give dream give dreams? Okay? So first of all, Dreams can warn us, okay? Uh, in Genesis 20, verse 3, and this is the story of when um, Abraham, because there's famine in the land, Abraham goes down to Egypt, okay? 
And Abraham's such a good guy, he, and we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, he tells Sarah, you know, pretend that you're my sister and not my wife. Ladies, how would that work out for you if your husband did that? He'd be in big trouble, wouldn't he? And so Abimelech, the king, tries to take her as his wife. And it's so interesting. So basically, he encounters God in a dream. It doesn't say that he dreamt about God. It says he encountered God in a dream. And the Lord came to him and said, if you sleep with her, I'll kill you. Wow. And he, he came out of that and he said, Abraham, you are lying to us. And God spared me, right? And so dreams can actually warn. And again, that's an extreme example, but... <laughs> but, right? Um, but God can warn. Okay, I had a dream once when we were in the nation of Japan. And uh, there was a... a Trying to be careful how I say this. There was a a family that had moved in as missionaries, and no one really knew them. And um, I actually had a dream that one of them was the the husband and the father was driving a school bus, and um, he wouldn't let anybody else sit in the driver's seat, and he wrecked the bus. And so. Um, the guy who was over the whole network over the nation of Japan was ministering in our church, and I said, I had this dream. And I told him about it, and he goes, that answers my question, right? It was a warning dream. You know, again, I was very careful with it, right? I didn't summon, come up to the guy and say, hey, the Lord showed me you're going to wreck the whole ministry, Right, but there was a there were some other things. It wasn't just based on a dream. Let me say that there were some character issues that had emerged, and as we had been praying, God spoke a warning through a dream. Okay, so we have to pay attention to how God speaks in those things. Okay, uh, another thing that God can do in a dream is that God will confirm His promise. Do you ever need God to confirm His promise to you? When you're on a journey of faith and you're just like, oh God, I, I've been at this thing. I've been believing for this thing for five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. And I haven't seen that happen. And, and God's so good along the way to say, I got you, right? And that's what he did. He, he reaffirmed in Genesis 28 to Jacob, hey Jacob, remember the promise that I gave to your grandfather? Remember the promise that I gave to your father? It's true. And I'm encountering you in a greater way to not only even remind you of the promise and the covenant that I made with him, I'm even giving you more revelation. And that's what God will do to us in every generation if we stay connected to him. He'll not only remind us of the promise that he made to our parents and our grandparents and our great-grandparents, but he'll even bring a greater dimension of revelation if we stay open and connected to him. Amen. So, you know, Jacob has this where God confirms this promise. Amen. Uh, I mentioned the series of dreams I had about uh, Bill Johnson and Bethel, and that was about seven years ago. Some of you have heard those, but, I, I, you know, just because it's such a foundational thing that God does in us, in many of you as well. And the first dream I had, I was actually in the nation of India. And uh, um, I had a dream, and in my dream, um, Bill Johnson was coming to Ardmore. And uh, Oprah Winfrey was interviewing him about the dream. And she was very, very unhappy that he was coming to Ardmore. And I woke up from that dream, and I thought, well, that was really weird. And I was rooming with a prophet, and I said, hey, I had this dream last night. that." Um, and I told him the dream. He says, well, you know what that means. He said, signs, wonders, and miracles are coming to your church and to the city of Ardmore. And in addition, now hear me, y'all. I'm not saying this about Oprah Winfrey. I respect Oprah greatly, right? But um, someone else that used to teach for John Paul Jackson said, 
uh, Oprah is a type and a type and a symbol of Jezebel in the dream. And Jezebel is very unhappy that this move of God is coming to your city and your region, right? So I was like, wow, that's an interesting dream, right? The next dream I had, Jamie and I are at, in Redding, California at Bethel. And um, Bill and Benny Johnson were talking to him, and Bill says, I, well, I need you to come to my office. I want to visit some more. Tell me about your church. Tell me about what God's doing. So we go in, but, and we sit in Bill's office at his desk, and, and Benny, his wife, actually comes and sits with us to talk to us, and we realize that Bill's behind us in the dream. I'm like, well, this is really interesting. Still don't know, totally know what all that means, right? If you're a dream interpreter, you can get it and tell me. Third dream, and this all happens in the course of about two months. The third dream, um, Bill Johnson walks up to me with a stack of architectural drawings and blueprints, and he hands them to me and said, these are yours. Right? Again, there's something that God is giving, not just to us, but to our city and our region, that the same transformative move of God that causes not only revival and awakening for a region, but also brings a, a transformation to a city. Amen. Amen. Where secular newspapers are publishing articles about Reading and saying stuff like, they really practice what they preach, there's a transformation happening. Right? The fourth and final dream, and again, God's confirming his promise to me. He's confirming all the things that I'm feeling in my heart. The fourth and final dream, we're back in Reading, and we're talking to Bill and Benny, and this time Bill said no. He goes, I don't want to hear about your ministry. I want to hear about who you are. You tell me who you are. I want to hear about you. And I'm standing there talking with him, and, and Benny grabs my hand and holds it like a mother would hold a child's hand. And, I, and it was actually the dream before this. No, it was this dream. I, w I woke up from this dream, and I was so aware in our house, there was this tangible presence and glory of God. And I'm like, oh, we've just received an impartation just through a dream. This is more than a dream. There was some type of encounter I had where the Lord's not just giving us revelation, but he's handed something off to us in the Spirit. And I'm going to take it, and I'm going to walk in it, and we're going to see a region transformed by the presence and the glory of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So God's confirming his promise. Amen. Um, another thing that, uh, I'm, I'm so off my notes, stay with me for a minute. Um, God often will give us dreams to help us launch into the new, right? And what happened with, what happened with Solomon, right? Uh, you know, um, again, I'm getting ahead of myself, you guys, I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm really pumped up, can you tell? <laughs> Joseph had a dream about where God was going to take him in the Old Testament, right? Joseph in the New Testament had a dream about what the Lord was going to do. Paul, on one of his missionary journeys, he's getting ready to go into Asia, and the, he has the, what we call the Macedonian call. And this is in Acts 16, where he sees this man in a night vision, it doesn't say much other than that he had this encounter and experience in the night. And this guy says, no, we need you to come to Macedonia, which is in Europe. And so Paul went into Europe rather than Asia because he changed the whole course, the whole direction of his life and his ministry because of a dream, right? When we were in the nation of Japan, God starts giving us, and I'm not going to tell them all for time, but God starts giving us all these dreams about a move of God in the state of Oklahoma, all throughout the entire state. And then we had about three or four dreams, and then um, he gave us specific dreams about Ardmore in southern Oklahoma, and we're just like, oh my gosh, God, what are you doing? And I literally typed up the dreams and sent them to some leaders in this city and said, this is what God wants to do in Ardmore, in the state of Oklahoma. And you guys lay a hold of it. 
And then God said, guess what? I want you to go back. And not that it's all about me, you guys. It's not. It's not all about me. It's not all about us just in this church. It's about a state and a region and a nation. But God's looking for people who will say yes to him. And, and it's bigger than just going to church on Sunday morning. Even though that's a big part of it. It's connecting to the purpose and plans of God because there's something new that he's wanting to birth. Hallelujah. Praise God. Um, God will also give us dreams that can help establish our future. What about the, the encounter that Solomon had when the Lord appeared to him and he says, dude, you can have anything you want. What if the Lord came to you in a dream and said, you can have anything that you want? And Solomon said, I need wisdom. I need wisdom so I can rule over the Lord's people. Amen. And God gave him an impartation of wisdom in the dream. I I mentioned the dream about the van pulling up in our our parking lot. And, And, you know, before that, in the dream that happened before that, um, I had a dream that we were at Voice of the Apostles, and uh, I was standing backstage, and I was worshiping, and Heidi Baker comes in with her entourage, right? I don't know if Heidi has an entourage, probably not, maybe, and her daughter said, hey, is it okay if we worship here with you? And I'm like, yeah, (laughs) it's totally good, right? And so we start worshiping together, and as we worshiped, we were traveling through the nations. And we were um, in Ecuador first. Never been to Ecuador, don't know anything about it, but we were worshiping in Ecuador. Next, we were in Senegal. Don't know anything about Senegal, but we were there. And then it ended when we were in um, Florida. Uh, We weren't in Florida. Heidi went and got Claudio Frazone. And Claudia Frazone was one of the uh, leading guys in the Argentinian revival. And Heidi brings him to me and she says, you need an impartation from Claudio Frazone. And he prayed for me. What I didn't know until later was that night that I had that dream, Claudio Frazone was at a gathering with Heidi Baker in Orlando, Florida. And in my dream, Heidi brought him to me to give me an impartation. And then after I got the impartation, Heidi began to say to me, she said, if you don't go to the nations, see, this is going to make me really accountable. Some of you have heard this. She said, if you don't go to the nations, everything you're doing will dry up. I woke up from that dream. and I went to the bathroom because I'm over 50. I got back in bed, and my dream immediately picked up. And Heidi said, if you don't go to the nations, everything that you're doing will dry up. And I was like, oh, this is serious. Because in my dream, I knew that I was having an encounter. Right? And that's when I, the, the, the van pulled up and all those things. And I just came out of that like, oh, that don't need no interpretation. Because that, that was an encounter, Right? And God will often give us uh, things to help establish our future. God will often want to, another thing he'll do, he will want to alert you to something, but it's something that you wouldn't readily accept. One of my favorite dream stories is from Linda Heidler, and I've already mentioned Robert Heidler. Years ago, when they began to transition their church in Denton, Texas, from a Bible fellowship to a spirit-filled church, Linda had a hard time. Because how many of you know when you really put Jesus and the Holy Spirit in control, things get crazy, right? And uh, in her dream, Linda had a chain of gold stuck in her calf, and she couldn't get it out. And so she wakes up and she tells her husband, she goes, I had this chain of gold stuck in my calf and I couldn't get it out what is that about 
And he said, I have no idea. Ask Chuck. So she goes to Chuck Pierce and she said, Chuck, I had this dream of a gold chain stuck in my calf. I don't know what it means. And he just starts laughing. He says, you've got a golden calf. You need to repent. And she said, and I repented because I'd made the church an idol. And I was trying to control everything that happened so that things would go the way I wanted it to go. And she said, the Lord said, nope, the church is your golden calf. Let go of it. So sometimes in our dreams, there are things that God's trying to speak to us that we won't receive. So when our defenses are down, we don't try to argue. And he just says, this is what I'm saying. Right? So be open to those things in your dreams, right? All right. So why does God, I'm, I'm, I'm coming in for a landing, y'all, so we can eat. All right? If your stomach is growling, just hold off. Right? So why does God give mystery dreams when we have a dream and we're like, you know, I know that was from the Lord, but I really don't know what it means. It's, first of all, to draw us closer to Him. Right? It's so that we will actually search out the answer. Sometimes God doesn't give us, we're, we're a microwave generation. If we can't binge watch all 10 seasons of Friends over Thanksgiving weekend, we're upset. That's a lot of friends, right? We need some deliverance after that. Right. He wants to captivate us, Amen. So, how do we seek out the meaning if we've received a dream? First of all, seek out people who are gifted. Right? Seek out people who are gifted. Secondly, um, go to Scripture. If you have a dream about a symbol, see what that means in Scripture. Okay? There are Christian books about dream symbols. You can use those, but be careful because something in, uh, something in my dream may mean something totally different. And you have to judge your dream in the context, right, of how God speaks to you. Go to God. He has the answer, right? He has the revelation. Now, we're all supposed to test all things. 1 Thessalonians 5, 20 and 21. Let's read this very quickly. And let's go ahead and read verse 19 as well. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophetic utterances. So if you are despising the prophetic, you're quenching the spirit. And then verse 21. But examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. Right? Examine things. Examine what God gives you. Test the spirit. Is your dream, is it your mind? Right? Is it the enemy coming to oppress? Or is it God who's come and he's come to encounter you and give you revelation? Amen? And you can judge those things pretty quickly. Amen? So, if you seek him diligently, he will reveal destiny to you. Amen? And here we are in the month of Kislev where he wants to give you revelation in the night. Amen. Let's stand together. Hallelujah. Father, we want to thank you for this day of celebration, for the worship. But Lord, and Lord, I, I just thank you I know people are already having lots of dreams, Lord. I, I hear those reports all the time. But, Father, in this season, Lord, I just pray right now for a spirit of revelation to be released to every person. Father, I pray for grace for people to, first of all, remember their dreams. <laughs> Secondly, to discern the source of what they're dreaming and third, to receive revelation, guidance, and wisdom by your Spirit. So, Father, let revelation, let a spirit of revelation come in a greater way to every person. Lord, those who are already dreaming, Father, I pray that you just bring it up another notch. 
Father, those who aren't dreaming, Father, I pray that you just release this and give us all remembrance. And Father, guide us, direct us, reveal yourself. And Father, thank you. Lord, I thank you that you give to us even in our sleep. So Father, stir up this within us, this understanding, this revelation, this mystery. Speak mysteries to us, God, and then give us wisdom and insight, God. Father, we thank you for this word. Thank you for what you reveal in Scripture. Thank you that, uh, Lord, you are always speaking to us because you're a living God that loves us very deeply, and you love humanity. And Father, we ask that you bless the food. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. So, um, if you do need, and I, I want to ask you to do this quickly, if you do have a physical need, uh, there will be a healing team to pray for you here. If you, um, and let's just do healing team today. Let's don't take time for prophetic ministry. Um, you know, if you're desperate for a word, I don't know, come next week. <laughs> <laughs> right, come tomorrow night. We'll prophesy to you, all right? <laughs> Bless you guys. Let's have a good time of fellowship. You are all invited. Amen. Praise God. And I did not cook, so you're safe.